that's where fear can either pull you back or drive you forward, bud. So I said to him, I said, look, use it as a way to get yourself mad. Use it as a way to say, there's no way I'm going to be fearful from this moment on and drive it that way. So you have to recognize the fear instantly instead of letting it control you, you control the fear, right? So. Welcome everyone to episode 20 of the Cassandra Properties podcast. We're going to remind everyone we're on episode 20 throughout the podcast because it really bothers Pete if I re <laughs> reference the episode. This one happens to be episode 20 as we move throughout the day. So uh, I'm joined today by a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man who has inspired me in many, many ways. And we'll get into that as we go through the show. Uh, Corey Shifter from Casal Jewelers uh, just runs Staten Island's preeminent retail jewelry store for designer brands, certified diamonds, engagement rings, watches, and fine jewelry. Wonderful guy. Very excited to have him here. Corey, thanks for coming in today. Thanks so much. Episode 20 as well. What an honor. <laughs> it, truly, <laughs> it truly is. I'm so grateful. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate you putting me in on this time. It's, it's got a good <laughs> ring, episode 20, right? I like it. How I you like doing it. over there on the ones and twos, Pete? Are you good? I'm good. I'm glad it's episode 20. Good. <laughs> happy, you're happy, too. <laughs> You weren't happy a minute ago. But, no, you know, he wasn't. The, but it's acceptance now, so we're good. Before we started recording, he <laughs> went into his, don't put the episode number ever, because we got a filler episode. No, it's episode 20. 20. All right. So, um, <laughs> as we often do on the show, we like to, to talk about, you know, the origin of what makes Corey Corey. You have done such an unbelievable amount of work in the community. Um, so, let's go back. Let's talk about parents, how uh, Casal came to be Casal, and how how you established yourself in the community, and, and what were your influences as a kid. Let's start back as, as a young lad. What okay. made Corey Corey? <laughs> so what made Corey Corey? There was a lot of things, but we'll start at age 11 when my uh, my parents decided to go into the jewelry business. My uh, my dad was very similar if, if for the Honeymooners fans out there that remember uh, Jackie Gleason played oh, yeah. the role part of trying to always find a, a harebrained scheme <laughs> <laughs> in order to make extra money. Well, my dad did the same thing from chirping bird alarm uh, door <laughs> hangers to uh, anything that was from Chinatown that he tried to bring in and sell. Really? He tried. He really did, my dad. Awesome. He went all in, and he tried everything. And then finally, finally, in November of 86, uh, he decided to uh, go into the jewelry business. And uh, my dad drove a taxi uh, all throughout the night. So he spent, we spent a lot of days with him. And uh, once he went into the jewelry business, he uh, sold his taxi medallion for around $25,000 back then and uh, took a second mortgage on our home in order to try to make a better life for our family and uh, started uh, Independent Jewelers uh, Market, which was located right by Cafe Luna on Highland Boulevard. Uh, they were there uh, from 86 to uh, 2009. And uh, from what I remember and what I recall as a kid, uh, I remember I was a terror and I used to run up and down their store because it was like a 100 meter run. And I used to run around and cause chaos. But at the same time, I just always remembered uh, the type of service that my parents always gave their customers. And, you know, it's kind of like welcoming uh, a friend or a new person into your home, you know, make them feel warm and welcome. And, and that's what my parents did. They always knew everybody's name. They always kind of, you know, knew about their kids and always asked about the family and was very, very personal in how they reacted and spoke to every customer. Like every customer was equally as important, whether they were getting a watch battery or or a, a diamond engagement ring, you know, so. So you've been around this as I was in, in the family business from the time you were a kid. Yes. And you yeah. were, I'm sure, dragged all hours of the day right to the store. Yep. Um, but those were, for me at least, super valuable lessons. Watching interactions between mom and the clients and yep. the customers, just not even realizing I was picking up and observing. Mm -hmm. um, but... And also, I think work ethic. My mom uh, was, for the most part, a single mom right. and put the hustle on, like, big time. And, and those things kind of imprint on you, I guess. Yeah, yeah it does. And, uh, you know, you've done a great job as well. You know, kudos to you and for what you've built because, yeah, you know what? It, all, it really all stems from family, really, you it know, and, and taking the good because, listen, there's good things that work and then there's failures that don't. You know, it's taking both of those and and watching and observing and, and learning how to push through even failures to make it work for you, you know? So it's something I guess I've learned throughout the way. I've seen my dad fail yep. with the bird chirper as well <laughs> as the door alarms that he's tried to do. Uh, but you know what? At the end of the day, he never said die. You know, he went out there and, and he, gave, he always put his best foot forward, um, always 
gave everything he had to everything that he did. Failure you know? is such an utter critical part of growth. And I didn't know that. I didn't allow myself to experience that or admit that, quite honestly, for many, many, many years, decades, honestly. Uh, I had done a video about this years ago yeah. uh, about fear mm -hmm. and how it that's what drove me. And it worked in a limited sense because the fear of not being successful had me running through brick walls headfirst, mm -hmm. but... Um, not allowing myself to really evaluate and say, no, I failed at it. Like, there's no putting a, a ribbon on this thing. Yeah. Like, this was not a, not a success. It, it, it is such a critical part of growth now. It's, it's in like a weird way. I almost kind of look forward to failing. Yep, you I know? understand. No, I don't. Because you, you, if you really peel it back, you can look at things and go, oh, I, I, okay, here's where I went wrong and get better. Yep. Um, and, and I feel like that has changed over the years. Like failure was, oh, no, no failing, yep. right? And no, now right. it's like, yeah, well, we can fail. Well, well, I think cool. that's our society, right? We're always told that we can't fail. And when we do, what do you do? Yeah. You know, how do you react? You know, what was your number one failure that kind of you remember? I'm kind of curious to hear that, actually, that, that you'll never forget. It's like and it's a turning point for you, I'm so, sure you know. Yeah, for me, um, it wasn't a specific event. It was the realization that my approach and what, what I, okay, so I'm going to peel, peel this back a little bit. For me, I thought that if I made the decisions, because I've always kind of been looked at that way as the decision maker and, you know, okay, whatever he's kind of deciding the ship is going to head is where we're going to go. Um, I thought that feeling in my heart and knowing in my head, or thinking I knew in my head, I was making the right decision was enough. And everyone would kind of fall in line behind me and, and I would go and... It was just, well, okay, he's going, so let's go, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And um, I did so much damage to people I care about. Um, that is without question for me when I s stopped and realized through a lot of, for a lot of different reasons, um, it's not enough to be well-intended and to rationalize, yeah, but look what we got done, right? Right. But but we got here, and then you turn around and there's a, a two miles of bodies, yep. <laughs> and there's collateral damage yeah, everywhere, yeah. No, no, and people it. are hurt. Um, but we got here, yeah. right? You, you guys said you wanted to get here, so I, I brought us here, right? Isn't this what we said? No, that is without question my absolute biggest failure is not taking the time to communicate and to. Um, recognize that just because I could put my head down and run through a wall didn't mean I should put my head down and run through a wall. You know, if you look to the right or you look to the left, walk around the wall. Yeah. Right? Yeah, there's a way through. And when you get to that finish line, maybe you're, you're not beaten and bloodied <laughs> and your troops are not, you know, exhausted and you can keep going. Right. So f without question for me, that is the biggest cataclysmic failure I've made with my people and, and people I care about deeply was not communicating and not um, understanding that there were different ways to do it. Yeah. It was my way or, hey, you know, you're asking me to lead, I'll lead. Right. This is how we're going to do it. And what a fail. Yeah. yeah. I get it. No, I totally get it. It's scary. It is very scary. You know, because fear can drive you one of two ways. You know, you can quit and, and, and f continue on that fearful journey of always being in fear or you could push through and use it as a driving force, which I'd like to I share a quick story, actually. So my, my son, who I, I try to mentor the same way, mm -hmm. uh, we were on his way to his playoff baseball game the other day, and um, the team we were playing, we, we had faced before. And my son, it was a 9-8 game, uh, last inning, bases loaded, and he came up to bat in his travel baseball game. And oh uh, boy. the kid, yeah, the kid was throwing absolute violent heat. <laughs> And the kid before him walked on four pitches where four pitches, one of them almost killed the kid. And uh, my son was up next. And you saw the fear in his eyes. I saw it. And he got up to the plate and three strikes right down the middle yep. and to end the game. And he was crying. He was very upset. And we, you know, of course, I, you know, 
I consoled him and all that other stuff. But at the end of the day, he, he left there in fear. And uh, we played them in the playoffs. And on the way to the game, I could see him sitting there in the car. And I approached him. I said, Cor, you know what's going on, buddy? You know, how, how you feeling? And he said, Dad, I'm afraid. And I said, well, what are you afraid of? And he said, well, that kid is going to be pitching again. I said, well, let me ask you this. Do you think he's afraid? You know, what do you think he's feeling on the other end, knowing that he's got it's you and him, it's you versus him? Well, I don't know, Dad. I don't. Well, you know, that's where fear can either pull you back or drive you forward, bud. So I said to him, I said, look, use it as a way to get yourself mad. Use it as a way to say, there's no way I'm going to be fearful from this moment on, and drive it that way. So you have to recognize the fear instantly instead of letting it control you. You control the fear, right? So needless to say, we talked for a few more minutes, and make a long story short, he went three for three. Two RBIs. Great. He came in. He pitched two and a third innings. Struck out seven kids. Wow. Right. So that's he faced seven batters. Outstanding. Yeah. So he gave up a run. He gave up a hit, and he gave up four walks. But he's nine years old. So that's he's not, great. He's, you know what? But he went in there, and I told him how proud of, I was of him, not because of what he did, but because I saw the look in his eye that he was going out there confident, and he overcame fear. That's tremendous. And he struck out that kid on three pitches. By yeah. the way. <laughs> so you know what? Uh, I tell him all the time, win or lose. Uh, the fact that he's going out there and giving 100% to everything that he does, I'm proud of him. Yep. You know, he played a basketball game the other day where he dove on the floor for a play that was going out of bounds and, and on concrete because we can't play indoors yet uh, for reasons we all know. But uh, <laughs> soon, hopefully, that'll change. But at the end of the day, you know what? He lost, and they lost the game. But he gave it 110%, and his team followed too, and they just lost by a point. You know what? But at the end of it, I gave him a big hug and told him how proud I was of him. And he looked at me like, we lost. And I said, yeah, but you know what? You gave it everything you got. You left it all out there. And I think if we can do that individually, not only for our children, but for our business and for our staff, and they see that we're okay with failing and we're okay taking fear and using it as a driving force and driving them to be able to motivate them as well, life's pretty good. You know, There's a fine line between... Failing and embracing it and right. it being okay. And I want to be careful how I, I phrase this. Sure. And participation trophies. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a very fine line between those two things. And I think that it's important. Both sides yep. are important. But you have to learn how to lose. 100%. You have to learn how to lose. And if you don't learn how to lose as a kid, you're not learning how to lose as an adult. <clears throat> and I was a prime example of someone who refused to acknowledge he lost. Right. And it was so damaging in ways you can't even begin to comprehend that that's like super important. As yeah. you were telling the story about your son, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a dad. I have a, a son and a daughter, similar experiences. And like, I was getting anxiety for you being the dad at the game, right? Yeah, it's yeah like, it was, it's it was, I had, crazy. I had plenty of that. Trust me. <laughs> I couldn't get rid of that. But, oh my uh, Lord. Yeah. It was interesting. We want them to succeed so much, but we know that not succeeding is really a big part of it. Yeah. yeah you have to get your butt kicked. And I argue with my son all the time. Oh, the referee, you know, the dude, yeah. I don't want to hear it. No, yeah, same thing. No, Hang that on yourself. That's, you guys lost. I don't care what happened. A spaceship came down and spaceship. dropped 20 new players for another plan. No, it yep. doesn't matter. You got your butt kicked. Yep. And that's okay. Just pick yourself up. If you don't like what you're feeling right now, right. remember it. Let it motivate you. Next time you get out on the practice field, think about that feeling. Think about that sting and get better. Yep. Or don't. Right. Right? Yep. We got off on a tangent there. That's good. We that's do a good that. tangent, though. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so... Independent Jewelers, you're running around the store as a kid. Yes. 1986. Yes. Okay. What happens between 1986? How do you go from that to, I mean, today you're Mr. Staten Island, like, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you are. I mean, you're, you're a household name. You're I appreciate that. an unbelievable um, brand. How does that happen? I mean, like kudos to that success. Um, failure, really. You know, I mean, uh, look, in 2009, it, everything led up to 2009. Prior to 2009, I was working in the... Uh, IT industry, I manage large scale computer development projects. 
So uh, my largest that I managed was after 9-11. I actually managed a large piece of a $43.5 million project that was put in place by Mayor Bloomberg at the time to redesign all of the computer systems for 911 call taking and dispatching. You're kidding me. Yeah, so basically when one of the towers went down, I can't remember which one off the top of my head, uh, there was a mainframe system underneath the tower that collapsed with it. So 911 when you dialed in was down for 23 minutes because they had to manually configure an old mainframe system over in Brooklyn, Metro Tech, yep. in order to start taking calls again and dispatching to the police. So uh, we came into play. I worked with Hewlett Packard uh, for a three-year project, three and a half years or so. And um, I helped manage and develop uh, infrastructure and software to handle those calls, dispatch those calls, whether there was a, a major catastrophe or not. So we built what it was called back then was a fault tolerant system that two systems in two different locations were constantly communicating with each other so that we would never have an outage again. So that background is, is that the impetus for 36,000 Facebook fans <laughs> and 16,000 Instagram fam, fans uh, and a, you know, 4.6 out of five rating uh, on Google. Is that background is that part of what helped you with this digital transformation in business or were those two connected or not connected Yeah, you know what it every road leads down to where i am today uh i learned how to be creative in how i managed my teams i learned how to be creative in developing software and kind of managing the team to be able to do that so i've always had a management skill on leading people and i guess leadership we talk about it all the time is is immeasurable you know, uh, people want to follow leaders, and, and that's something that I, I strive to become. And when I first took over in the jewelry business, I wasn't that. I was a scared, uh, very, very scared, because I expected things to be much better than what they were financially for the business at the time. But, uh, you know, going out and being confident in what I did on these projects, working for the stock exchange and working for these other corporations, you know, they brought me in to manage these big projects that were very, very important to them and, and to be able to lead all of them to success. Again, failures a little on the way, but mm -hmm. learning from my failures of things I would never do again helped me when I came into the jewelry business because I realized that it's much different now. Yep. You know, I came in where, you know, the first day of sales was $20, which is a $20 repair. The wow. second day of sales was $5, which was a jewelry cleaner, which now today we give away to all of our customers free <laughs> uh, without charging $5, you know? So that was our second day. So $25 in sales in the jewelry business isn't really something that keeps you afloat. And, um, and really, I had to come up with a creative way of, of managing the business and becoming a leader so that my staff can see that, yeah, I'm just not a, a sitting duck trying to figure out what to do, you know? So that's kind of, there's a couple of things along the way that helped and uh, others along the way that I learned from that brought me to where we are today. So, you know, let's talk about what some of those things are because going from a 20, 20 I mean, good Lord, $20 in sales day yeah. one, $5 in sales day two, did you see that this was headed so for me, uh, because I was in the business, um, around the business, and then in the business very early, mu much way before all this technology s took place, right? And, and that change for me was a slow, resistant, difficult change. Right. Um, for you, when you got in, did you see that, oh, okay, this is where it's headed, and I've got to start investing in digital infrastructure? Did you see that right off the hop? or No. No. No, uh, initially, uh, I, again, was under the impression that I would come into a business and immediately be successful, right? Based on after we closed on the business and whatnot, um, you know, the numbers that we thought weren't, you know, unfortunately, and, um, but fortunately, if it makes sense, they weren't, yep. because I had to learn, Yep. you know, not many people realize that, you know, Casal Jewelers was a household name on Staten Island for a long, long time. And when I took over, I still had that interpretation because he was a competitor of my dad. I didn't know what he was doing out mm -hmm. there. I paid attention to what my dad was doing. I didn't care about anybody else at the time. So uh, thinking I was taking over and, and coming into something that I wasn't was a little, you know, fearful, I guess. We could use the word fear again. Uh, I was afraid. I was scared. Uh, there were times I called my dad in tears. Uh, what did I get myself into? Um, please help me. Um, and my dad, you know, provided my first <laughs> idea on how to run a promotion to get people into the store. So what I did was, was I, uh, it's a funny story. So I, I, uh, I posted on the front page of the newspaper that had these tear offs. It was like a mm -hmm. post it. Yeah. So I, I bought the whole island. You know, my dad lended me the money because I didn't have any left. Right. And I, I posted to the whole island that I was going to give away a free watch battery, you know, just to get people in the store to get to meet me. I'm a new owner. You know, it wasn't anything. 
that uh, I felt was going to be a big money maker. But at the end of the day, giving away a free watch bet, uh, at least I'll get to meet some people and yep. people will come in because nobody came in for two weeks. So we ran this promotion and I was all excited. I had a suit on the other day. I was very excited and I couldn't wait to see where it happened. Now, I was in my back office and we have a doorbell system. So you ring the bell and pe we know people coming in. The bell was ringing like crazy, right? And it was, I was so excited, you know? It was like, it was happening, you know? Yeah. It was like, I can't believe this. It rang more that in that half hour that I was sitting in the back than it rang the first two weeks I was in business, right? So I come downstairs feeling good, you know, look, and I look around the store and I realized something. They were all senior citizen men with Ziploc bags filled with watches, <laughs> screaming that I didn't put limit one per customer oh, on the ad. No. So needless to say, <laughs> it was the worst experience I ever had in my life to the point where I ran in the back. And the sales girls came to the back and like, you have to handle this. You have to take care of this. They said, look, I have no idea how to handle this. I'm like, <laughs> you guys have to do this. You've been in the business. I don't know what I'm doing. I need you to please help me make this right. So they went back downstairs fought off the people, got them back into the accessor ride where they came from. And at the end of the day, oh, you know man. what? A valuable lesson was learned. There's no quick way to turn your business around and, and make it a success overnight. Yep. Right? So that kind of really, that was my first learning wow. lesson of what to do and what not to do to the point where five years later, I still had a guy come in with that thing, you know? And, uh, no way. Yeah, didn't have, a, didn't have an expiration date either. <laughs> Oh, I forgot that part. Did I not say that the first time? <laughs> there was no expiration date either. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that was really a, a big fail. And yeah. I thank you for the Staten Island Advance for not making me aware of that uh, <laughs> in my day. Lisa Taft was handling things. So, Lisa, I acknowledge you over on the air. Uh, and, um, you know, no, it, listen, it, it all happened for a reason. You know, we all, every scenario that happens in our life, I feel like happens for a reason because we're able to guide ourselves and, and fight through that, which we did. And uh, learn from it as well. I never did that again. But that uh, is an outstanding story. It was a good one. It was certainly a good one. Yeah. And I'll never so, forget it. So how do you start to to turn the ship? How do you start to, you okay. know? Okay. So story number two. So uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Christine Fiorenza, I'm sure you know Christine. Sure. She's been around a long time in the Staten Island community, uh, invited me to go to a Chamber of Commerce mixer. And it was at the uh, the Renaissance, mm -hmm. actually, right on... Uh, um, Right on uh, Highland, not far from the store. Go there. It's a business after hours. You get to meet people. And there's so many business people that will want to communicate with you and you'll connect with. So I'll, I'll never forget. I was all excited. I parked on Midland Avenue again, back into my suit. Probably the same one I wore on the day of the battery, which is probably the same results that you'll find out in a second. But uh, I walked around there and I had tons of business cards ready to go, you know. And I went into these groups of people, right, that were communicating. And I kind of just barged in right? Waited for them a moment, right? And I started to pitch myself mm -hmm. on how, um, because how jewelers, I have this, this, and this, I provide these services as well, repairs, if you need anything, blah, 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 blah. And then I walked around and I gave everybody business cards, right? Mm -hmm. And then I moved on. And I probably did this to the whole room to the point where I had a few business cards left. But there was one point where I grabbed some food and I was sitting at the table to, by myself with a glass of wine in front of me. And I took a sip of my wine and I looked around and I said, what did I just do? I was yeah. all by myself, right? So I was the guy that proposed on the first date to everybody in that place, yep. right? And they thought there was something wrong with me. Yep. And I was the guy that was pushy, pushing myself, not even caring about what anybody else thought because I didn't know any better. But that hit me right there. And um, it turned me to the point where I realized that I have to build relationships first with you people give before to get. they trust to do business with me. Yeah. They didn't know who I was. So in my business, popping the question is great. But not when you're first meeting somebody, the first time you see them, do you whip out a business card and tell them all about you, right? You want to learn about others. Yep. So at that point, I was introduced to the American Cancer Society. I wound up connecting with somebody from there. We started this big business council uh, where we just had events. There was a bunch of us uh, that got together, um, uh, business leaders in the community, and I learned from them. I asked them a lot of questions. Mm. Uh, Phil Guineri, believe it or not. Yeah. I remember instrumental uh, instrumental in leading me to, to the right place. I sat with Phil at an event and I just asked him questions and just went around to everybody and started learning from everybody and realizing that, wow, you know what? People are really receptive when you ask them questions, you know, and when you want to communicate with them, not about you, but really truly value what they have to say. Yep. And I did. I truly valued what they had to say, right? They, they guided me to want to be more active in the community where I had to now go to my family and say, you know, dad, my brother, Danny, both of them were investors in the business at the time. I'm going to do things different. You know, I'm not going to be at the store every single day, hoping that someone comes in to see me. I'm going to go out of the store and try to meet and network and impact our community 
differently than anybody else has ever done before because I feel like that's my calling. I feel like that's what I want to do. Bold. And they were against it. Yep. My dad was more of an in-store person Yep. Uh, that felt like I should do promotions to bring people in. I felt like I should go out, build relationships, and then in turn, after time, right, because time is needed, uh, those relationships will build and grow and, and that people will trust to do business with with a name that they can trust, that, that they'll go to and be taken care of. So, and here I am, you know, 11 years later, grateful for our Staten Island community for for being there for us. And uh, I do everything I possibly can to be able to support our community for, for what our community has done for us over the past 11 years. And I'm so grateful and blessed to be a part of the Staten Island business community that wants to give back. And there's so many people like yourself and so many others that go out there and do it. Me, I just find a creative way to implement it in our everyday you know, to do things and promotions and have it be fun and different like, ways of giving away stuff and supporting our charities and stuff like that. So I guess that's a gift. I guess that's my gift is, is somehow creatively, you know, be involved and uh, be out there, you know, and be a light for people that, uh, that really can't see uh, and try to just open their eyes to what's good in our community and be able to give back as well. So, you know, you've raised an unbelievable amount of money through your efforts in local charities. And as you said, you've got uh, a knack for creating neat events, memorable events, right? You've, you've put an interesting spin on things. And I had opened up by saying you had inspired me in a, in a profound way. And I'll, I I'll that. share this now. Um, so we've always been um, a charitable company, but we've uh, been very in the shadows about it uh, because it, it didn't feel right to me and it was more um, just me having a fear of the spotlight than anything else. So another thing that most people don't know about me, awful fear of public speaking, what we're doing right now, being out front and center. When I'm in my space, I go. I, I know it. I feel it. Yep. I've got been blessed with vision, and I, I can go. But this, for me, was as foreign as foreign could be. Yeah. I just didn't do it. I never did it. And I started to develop a reputation of, oh, well, he's just a, he's a, you know, you want him on your side in a transaction, but he's, you know, that guy. You know, he's not very social. And, and that's actually not who I am at all. I'm a bit of a goofball. Yeah. And uh, I just had a terrible fear and anxiety of, public speaking and just being social situations. Right. It just was with me. So that tied into our uh, charitable um, direction, if you will, in the company. And as I started to get more involved over the last couple of years, you may or may not, or people out there may or may not have noticed, I've gone from being really kind of quiet to being around. It's been a big part of my growth is get out of my comfort zone and do these things and watching you uh, before I knew you the way I know you now, I was like, who is this freaking guy? Like, wow, you really inspired me. You you were out there at of every event, re constantly raising money. And my thought was, huh, if he's being visible in his efforts and it's inspiring me, Perhaps I should be more visible in my efforts and maybe I can inspire the next person. And if that comes with some criticism of, well, you know, you shouldn't do it because there's that mindset with some people. You shouldn't do charity. If you're going to do it, no one should know about it. Nonsense. You do what feels good for you and you do what works for you. And for me, I now have had impact on other people. Uh, because of you, I started the season of giving yes. in this company. Because of you, uh, we have really made the community outreach and um, charity woven into the fabric of everything we do here. Yes. Uh, so the, I never, ever, ever would have done it if it wasn't for you. And I think it was, I, I first started to kind of notice from the chamber. I think that's where it started. Or maybe it was SIEDC. It was through one of the organizations like this dude, like, well, like wow. And your passion and you've got that personality where I don't. You know, you're a very, you know, amiable guy. You're a very likable guy. You're a very social guy. And for me, that's really hard to do. So thank you for that. Well, you're doing it, by the way. So I'm, I'm getting better at yeah, it. Yeah, I never thought of you of, of that, which is good, right, of a guy fearful of yeah. that spotlight. But you know what? Kudos to you for getting out of your comfort zone. And thank you for the kind words. I, I don't like hearing those things. You know, I, I, I get weird. I guess yep. that's one thing I don't, I appreciate it, but 
and I'm thankful for for those words that you've given to me. I mean, it's great. As you can see, I'm getting caught up in my words now just because it's out of my comfort zone to hear that because I just want to do what's right. And if I can do what's right and still support my business and my family at the same time, then I'm doing something right, you know? Well, you're doing um, it right to a whole nother level, right? Rotary Club, Paul Harris, Harris Award, Young Professional of the Year Award, Lewis R. Miller Award, on and on and on. You have really taken it to a completely different level, and you are now known as that guy. It's your Corey, the community guy, who has a jewelry store, right. which is pretty freaking epic. Pretty epic. Thank you. And the community is, is very appreciative. And here you are on episode 20, <laughs> 20. of the Cassandra Properties podcast, Pete. <laughs> By the way, we're in like, like this is so cool. Yeah. There's, we have an audience somehow in 50 different countries. <laughs> That's awesome. So I think it's going to be hysterical if people start showing up at your store again. <laughs> looking for, <laughs> yeah, for, for watch batteries. batteries. Yeah, no, that ad is gone. You cannot find it on Google <laughs> Images as well. I removed it. I paid a lot of money to have it removed. But yeah. Pete's yeah. in the corner going, uh, yeah, I was yeah, looking for yeah, it. Yeah, he's looking. He's searching right now. I see it. Oh, man. All right. That's so crazy. you 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 start to feel, uh, uh, well, l let me ask. I shouldn't assume. Did you start to feel that that was the way that you should change your approach or were you reading books or were you, uh, did you have a, a, a business coach or a mentor or it was just organic? Yeah. You know, it just felt right. Amazing. You know, honestly, God led me in to really help his people, if we want to say it. And um, I've been kind of traveling down that road of pretty much everything you mentioned as well. Uh, I, I am a guy who lives in fear as well but I've turned that fear when I feel it into something that's going to be a driving force. So each and every day I try to learn each and every day I wake up. It's, it's like, it's, it's hard, you know, being in business. We know, you know, it's the unknown, you know, and uh, we do our best to do our best for our family and lead our family in so many ways. And, uh, and it's a, it's great. You know, it's a, it's a blessing. It really, really is. And uh, at the end of the day, if, if I can, like you said, impact the lives of others uh, by doing what's right, then, I must be doing something right, I oh, guess. Oh, no you know? doubt about it, But brother. it's fun. You know what? Honestly, I have fun with it, you know? And, and the first big thing I ever did is actually pretty cool is the, the race for the ring, which, mm -hmm. you know, we pretty much gave away a ten dollars to $15,000 engagement ring yep. every year. And what where it spurned from was was I was driving over the Outer Bridge on a Sunday night uh, coming back home uh, from the Jersey Shore, and uh, where I met my wife, by the way, out in Osprey. Uh, but needless to say... Um, so coming over the bridge, there's a lot of traffic, as you know. So that used to be like crazy back then, 10 years ago. And uh, I saw a billboard over the outer bridge thinking, wow, you know, I can get all these kids that are coming home from the shore with a big engagement billboard, right? Yep. Uh, promoting engagement rings. Yep. So I had called the, the company that was housing the board. And at the time, it was a six-month minimum, 8000 a month with a, a design fee of three, dollars $4,000. So I was looking at about a $50,000 investment, which I didn't have. Wow. Right? So at that moment, it hit me. What can I do that's fun, that would get people interested in learning more about engagement rings, that were a big bridal store, because bridal's fun, it's nice, and it's really, really meaningful. So what I did was, was I called Christine from the Nicotia Group, yep. and we had a relationship from St. John's. I used to run the student union, and she used to be my liaison between the school and them. So uh, I called her, and I actually asked her uh, if she'd be interested in doing something like this, you know, a big run and big race for a ring and yeah. all this stuff, and she was in. So we, uh, we got a bunch of bridal vendors together, and throughout the years, it evolved more and more into being something that people remembered. People recognized Casal Jewelers' race for the ring. Not only did we give away a big engagement ring to one lucky couple, but, you know, we ran our comedy night in between it, yep. you know, every year that netted over $150,000 over the past nine years to local charities on the island, you know, and it allowed for the couples to get together, bring their friends and family, their friends and family met before this big race because someone's proposing at the end of this race. Right. That's what the, that's what the race was. So, you know, some people actually asked for their hand in marriage before, right? So mm -hmm. at the comedy night and the comedians had a lot of fun with it, a lot of laughs, but at the same time, you know, we raised a lot of money for charity, which, it's something I always kind of try to do is think of our community and everything that we do as far as promotions go. So the race for the ring was that it was something that drove the community to see that we're doing something fun, uh, giving money to charity and, you know, giving somebody a, an engagement ring, you know, and, and having that us share that special moment with them. So it was pretty cool. Actually. Very, very cool. So yeah. you be in similar in, in my business, at least on the residential side, you do get to share um, some really intimate moments with your clients yeah. and your customers. Right, you know, purchasing a home, particularly the first-time home buyers, 
you just forge relationships. Yep. They they become like family, yeah. you know, and and you you watch them go through life and and you know go from step to step. And I would imagine the same thing for you, seeing them at you know to be young and in love, yep. getting engaged. Yeah, it's good true. stuff. That is good stuff. I guess funny thing you bring up is that you know as a kid and you were in the business too. Now I'm seeing the the kids that were me and were run, me and them were running up and down yep. the store. Now they're coming in, you know, buying their engagement rings and you know, and my fa- my family said this would happen over time is that we'll start to see the people that they helped, the parents that they helped to get engaged and start their relationships with their families and stuff. The kids that I was playing with, you know, running up and down the store are now coming into me, you know, yep. uh, you know, so that it really encompasses the whole family business really that yeah, people look for and strive for is to always continue not only with your family, but with the other families as well as they grow, which is something that we've, had the pleasure of doing. You know, Staten Island um, gets such a bad rap, and it is such a great place. If if you do the right thing, 100%. they give you a shot here. Like, you know, the community will embrace you if you embrace the community. And, you know, we have such a bad reputation. I was doing some, some statistics the other day, Googling around uh, the household count in Staten Island. And in that search comes up why does Staten Island I don't remember the exact words so don't hold me to it but it was something like why does Staten Island have such a bad reputation I was googling statistics of how many households there are on Staten Island yep. and you know outsiders have hated on us but if it, it is an awesome community yep a very close knit tight kind of place where if you do the right thing uh, the community is there for you with you know in a big way. Tenfold. Listen, when things were normal, right, before this all Ugh. happened, and there were events going on multiple times a week, you would go to events where there was five, six, seven hundred people, right, consistently supporting yep. charities, supporting families, giving back. So it's not just me. I just found a creative way of doing it. There are also six or seven hundred people there, you know, investing their money, investing their time in this family, in this organization. And, you know, we're just a, we just came up with a fun way of giving something away and raising some money at the same time, right? And um, being there for them as well. But, you know, there are a lot of other people in our community that also go out of their way. Maybe they're not as creative as us in a sense, but you know what? They do go out of their way to be at every single event. You see the same face and they're always giving me that 20 bucks to, to try to win that trip or that diamond necklace we're giving away, you know? And at the same time, they're just as an integral part of what Staten Island is as, as, yep. as everybody is really, you know? So yes, yeah, Staten Island does get a bad rap. I don't understand why I understand the, the shows and the, whatever the perception of those outside of Staten Island. But when Superstorm Sandy hit mm-hmm. and we were out there oh, a yeah. lot, oh, yeah. it was, it was unbelievable. The work that the community was doing. It was remarkable, remarkable to see how fast with really an, absence of any direction right there there was things happening that had never happened before and people were ill prepared for it um and i remember very vividly going down highland boulevard there was one store um i'll give them a shout out because they really did do the right thing back then family fruit yep um that for whatever reason they didn't lose power and so many of the other places up and down highland boulevard lost power and Everybody rolled up their sleeves, literally, and we're in houses ripping things out and trying to just get to some sort of baseline. And, and there were frontline workers, but there was also just frontline community workers. And um, I remember, I think it was the National Guard was there, and they hadn't been fed in a couple of days. Wow. And um, Lou from, from Family Fruit uh, put together, just literally wiped the store out, and we just started making sandwiches and whatever we can cobble together and bringing it out and setting up stations on the corners and just trying to get food out. And it was just like, it was that kind of thing. There was no, okay, I'm going to go back to my community now. It's time for dinner. It was 24 seven, seven days a week, just unbelievable mobilization of the community and uh, really spoke to who we are as a community. Yep. Yeah. Listen, perception Unfortunately, is everything to some people, but the people who are in it, it's fine. Yeah, you know they call us the hidden borough. You know they they the un whatever they call it forgotten, forgotten borough. borough forgotten, uh, yeah, everything. But we're not forgotten. The people within it are strong. Um, I think that again that demonstrates truly what Staten Island is is yeah. the good things. And unfortunately, uh, the media puts out the bad things. Yep. And 
for anybody who watches the news, you know, it's 29 minutes on a half hour segment of negative. Yep. Except for the weather, sports, well, sports for the Jets. The Giants <laughs> is negative, but uh <laughs> Yeah, I'm a Nets chick. I am a Knicks, Jets and Mets fan, so my hope is in the Mets, but anyway, so, you know, the last minute they talk about something positive, right? So, unfortunately, the media puts out stuff that maybe isn't the best really because i think good news doesn't travel as fast as bad news so it's funny isn't it yeah it's i don't know you know i always try to put out positivity i always try to pull people together through my social posts and whatnot and try to be positive because that's what i instill in my family that's what i bring into my store you know we hire it's funny because people always ask me you know your staff is so nice they're so kind they're so loving well that's what i hire i hire nice kind and loving people because at the end of the day, you can't teach someone to be kind. <laughs> you can't teach someone to love, you know? So at the end of the day, uh, you know, if, if I can train somebody that wants to learn and wants to be this loving, kind person that we have a, a, an image of what's in our store, and I know that I can trust them being in my store, then I'm, I'm okay. You know, I can have a person walk out and not really find what they want, and maybe the salesperson wasn't the best at selling that type of thing or whatever it was. But if they were treated kindly and they were treated with love and and, and appreciative of the fact that yep. they could be back, yep. you know, and at the end of the day, they leave with a good feeling. Maybe they just didn't find what they found this time, but they were gracious enough to give us a shot. So not, you know, look, we don't cover it. Everybody would be great if we did, you know, but at the same time, no one's going to leave unhappy, Yep. you know, and uh, that's one thing that I always instill in my staff is just be kind and love on everybody, no matter what the situation. And we're grateful that we've been able to do that over the years. Really good stuff. And, and in that vein, uh, I wanted to touch on just where we are Globally as a country, not globally as a country and globally, I guess, and locally. Um, there is so much angst out there and, w- and the country is so divided. You hear story after story and you see and you experience friends that are no longer friends, brothers and sisters that don't talk anymore over political leanings um, and, you know, we have a country that spent, I had... Um, done some homework before because I wanted to, I thought that this tied in because there's a few other places I want to take this. Um, we spent $14.1 billion wow. on this election. <laughs> $14.1 billion. There were some races where individual candidates spent over a hundred million dollars on one candidate in one race, how do we do better as we talk about taking care of our neighbor and we talk about, you know, helping those that need help and we talk about empowerment and we talk about, again, I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, in between, doesn't matter to me. Yeah. We all should be compelled to help each other, right? Right. Can you imagine what you could have done with that fourteen point one billion? How many mouths you could have fed? How many roofs you could have put over people's? I mean, families that are living in the street, and people who can't source food. Yeah. And as a country, while we lecture each other on both sides and we we take the moral high ground, fourteen point one billion dollars in one election cycle. Wow. I didn't know that. That's a lot. It's a startling. Yeah number you know we have a program here that i'm hyper critical of the deer vasectomy program interesting right yeah so we have people you drive up and down staten island you see it everywhere who are living in the damn streets struggling to to put food on the table and we are spending millions of dollars a year to catch deer and give them a vasectomy to try and beat Mother Nature. I don't know. How, how did we get, and that's, I'm picking on one program. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, just yeah. that one stands out to me because <laughs> it, it just, <laughs> it's like, you it's know. It's to say serious when you hear that, I guess. It's uh well, be, you know, Crazy. because people feel, and, and I appreciate, and I'm an animal lover yes, through me, and through, yeah. um, but I, I can understand people saying, well, we, we don't want to have them hunted. It's inhumane, whether it is or it isn't. Um, we go from there 
right? Because we, we don't like the idea of harvesting an animal to allocating millions of dollars to a pro- when people are not eating. Right. And people don't have a roof over their head. How did, how did this happen that we've made so many lefts and rights as we've gone through this, you know, and then you wake up one day and you go, wait, what? How did this happen? And how do we get it back? Man. Well, I don't even think there was a place to, I can't say get it back. I don't think it ever existed. How do yeah. we get better? How do we just do better? Look, the, the Bible says we should be loving each other more than anything, really. And I think love in this world is missing. I think the love and respect for others is missing. The love and respect for authority is missing between what's happening with our police officers and this, pol- this whole political race. Yeah. There was no, there was more bloodshed yeah. kind of technically, I guess, uh, sound than anything. I think we're missing the fact that, like, you know, we're commanded to love each other, right? And not like each other, but you know what? Um, I'm very spiritual, as you know. Uh, you know, I, I try to lead my, my family and my life like Jesus led, love others, give to others, uh, and just to be, uh, be a light for others to see, you know, and that's what Jesus did, you know, when he came here. Uh, so I always kind of, I look at his life and I try to implement that into my own. Uh, I think the world is missing that. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, this, this, this virus really did put a damper on everybody's hope. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's, uh, it's an eye opener of what was missing in our society uh, was that, that love and respect for family uh, that is missing uh, love and respect for each other um, and our and our authorities. I mean, look, in Romans 13, if anybody ever wants to go, the, the first paragraph is talking about how leadership and how God puts leadership in place. You know, he puts them in place, you know, and um, spiritually we believe that and we accept that. We're acceptance of who is in a position of leader, as a leader right now, and then we should be acceptance of that. And I understand there's a lot going on, and I'm not getting into that part of it. I'm just more quoting what's truth but uh, at the end of this when it finally does come to a resolution whichever way it goes because mm-hmm. we know there's a lot of questioning of ballots and all that other stuff um it's not really my point my point more is is that you know we have to respect each other we have to love on each other and really think about uh god's people first you know and that's i feel like that's we stepped away from that yeah, oh, you know, yeah. We're, we're, we're letting the world orchestrate uh how we react uh what we do what we give to right we should be giving to our people right um and I feel like, you know, using the analogy of the deer, I guess not the analogy, I guess the, the, uh, the idea of that is, um, I didn't know that, um, is interesting. But at the same time, yeah, that would be nice to have that in place, but it would also be much better, I guess, to be serving the people who are homeless and, and that had homes and that had a family to support, and now they're out of work. Yeah. You know, and I, um, again, I know our government has given to them. I'm not sure to what level, again, because I'm not too much into that, really. But uh, I think if we all just really focus on what's real and what's real is that if we can love and respect each other, then this world would be a much better place. Now, again, we don't have to like everything that everybody does. Oh, of course. It's not, we're not commanded to like everyone. Uh, we're commanded to love each other. Uh, and, you know, God loved us first so we can love each other. And I just feel like that's kind of the thing that's missing and that's something that, that we can bring back. You know, um, as I'm sure you're involved with uh, as well, you know, John Maxwell yep. with the community transformation that he's doing on Staten Island. Let's talk it's about be that amazing. a bit. Yeah, you know, um, I actually listened to, uh, on the way here, I listened to John and the work that his team is doing with Chad and Danielle Reyes, yep. um, getting together and doing a community transformation. They've done this in other countries and it's worked and it's been so effective to where people are impacted and, and lives are changed, you know. Um, they're going out and we're in the beginning phases really of, of doing an analysis to see what's needed in our community of Staten Island. Mm-hmm. And the John Maxwell team is coming in to find out what's needed and to put a process into place to correct that and to make things better for our community. So uh, they, they've, it's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, so uh, I, and I wanted to, to chat with you about this. They've, they've done uh, this transformation program in Guatemala, Paraguay, Costa Rica. Yes. Um, how does that apply to Staten Island? Like, what, 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 what are, what are they looking at? Of course, I signed on for it. You know, and, and uh, Chad and Danielle, wonderful yes. stewards of the community. One hundred percent. John Maxwell, an, an inspiration, uh, if there ever was one. I mean, this guy is amazing. So, um, what is the program going to look like? How do people get involved? Let's let's spread a little love here because yeah. I think it's important. I think the first thing first is we have a survey that we're putting together that we're going to survey the community and look exactly what the community needs and what, what the community wants. You know, we're not just going to go and make that decision on our own, which I'm sure we, we all can, but we're going to want to question the community and, and come up with a plan 
uh, of how we're going to really transform the community. Now, it's it's really, I guess, getting the feedback of what's needed here um, most. And uh, John and his team have done an excellent job of taking that feedback and, and putting a plan into place. And together, you, me, and everybody that's involved uh, really transforming the community to see that, you know, we're bringing light and love into the community that probably is missing right now, you know, and there's certain ideas of things that they need to come up with first through those surveys of what we're going to really go out and do. So it's exciting, actually, you know, we met, we sat down, we had a big round table, we speak every week. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of determine the next steps along this process. And John Maxwell and his team are pretty much guiding us that way. So like you mentioned, they're transforming countries, right? And now yeah. they're coming to Staten Island, you know, uh, 500,000 borough, uh, Amazing. borough and wanting to do that for us. You know, seeing that there's, there's so much community love here that goes unnoticed that if they can bring that to the forefront and make that more of what people look at as far as Staten Island goes, then they did their job, right? Because there is so much good. There really is. And there's yeah. so much help that's needed to get people to see that good. So I feel like John and his team, along with Chad and Danielle and everybody who's involved, are going to be able to bring people back to what's real. you know. And that's a, a community that loves each other, a community that's there for each other, and not just draw on the negative uh, that's been happening. But find that negative and, and also, you know, along the way, transform what our thoughts are, how we handle those things, and what we do to progressively move forward so this doesn't happen again. So, so it's exciting. It really is. So the 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 geographical area is limited to Staten Island. Yes. Okay. Um, so it's really interesting that you know, as we had said, Staten Island offers some amazing things. I think that we're uniquely positioned for something like this. I think that um, we have some unique opportunities, as we hopefully are. are Great news on, on a potential vaccine yes. uh, yesterday. Um, as we begin to emerge from this, I, I believe that we are positioned to do some amazing things in Staten Island. From the John Maxwell Community Transformation, uh, I believe that we have an opportunity to do a lot of neat things in the green technology space. Yes. Um, we have access to certain geographical assets that are, are really critical. We have access to a working capital or working pool of, of people that uh, are in need of, of jobs now. Um, the, the city and state, I have to say, have been very good about making programs available um, to further explore those avenues. And I think we can emerge as a community and, and be a leader in an emerging space for the whole country, Yes, you know, maybe the world. And I, I believe we have the right people here, the right, you know, human capital, the right um, circumstances to to do that. So um, I've never been more, I've always been a, a Staten Island guy or Staten Island rah-rah person, yeah. but I've never been more excited yeah. for Staten Island. Yeah. I do think that we have a really amazing opportunity in front of us. And if we, if we seize it, um, we can look back in 10, 15 years and, and go, wow. Yeah, I agree. I think this is just the beginning for the Maxwell team starting at Staten Island. Yeah. And look, I mean, I hate to bring this up as an example, but, you know, the coronavirus started from what we gather in one area of China, right? Mm -hmm. And look how it spread to the world. Yep. We can do that on a positive note. Yeah. Right. And bring love to the world and bring hope to the world that's missing right now. Right. Just by starting here. So there's always a starting point. Uh, to which this happens. And good news does travel fast. Hope and love does travel fast. And you know what? It's, People get a good feeling when you're around someone that's that's shining light, uh, that's that's bringing love, that's that's making people feel, others feel good and feel valued, you know. So when you have that, I feel like that's that's that can easily transition out to the world as well, which I believe John and his team will do um, as well. But we're the, we're the starting ground in the states, from what I gather. So it's pretty exciting. It's it's unbelievably exciting, and and I think that you're 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 at the exact right moment. Mm -hmm. You know, the election happened. We have a president. We don't have a president. It's contested. It's not contested. Right. Either way, everybody woke up the next day. Yep. Right? The world kept going. Everything just continued. And I do feel like there is a moment of <sighs> yeah. right now. And in that, <sighs> you can capture hearts and minds. I do think that the level has dropped down five or six, you know, points on the the intensity scale yep. and i do think there is a moment in time here now where we can reach out to folks and say hey let's take that energy let's take that passion don't care what side of the aisle you're on right. and let's p 
pull together and do something good. Yep, so I agree. best of luck with, with that endeavor. Yep. Um, something that I think really is at the ground zero of something really cool. Yeah, me too. Good stuff. Yeah, happy to be a part of it as well. Definitely. Thank you. Absolutely. So um, I feel like we've kind of talked about the impacts of Corona to death, um, you know, <laughs> on, on a stupid way of saying it, right? Um, on the, the small business community. We've been rocked by yeah. it. I'm sure you guys have been rocked by it. Um, I don't think there's ever been, I, I, there has never been a more important time to shop small. I agree. And to uh, look to your neighbor and help lift them up and, you know, make that decision to support small business because it's tough right now. It is. Can you talk us through uh, some some things as we head into the holidays? How do people get in touch with you? And, and what are some of the things you have coming up? And, you know, keep, keep, please, everyone, keep at the forefront of your decisioning um, before, before you click that, you know, buy it now button. Right. There, there are a lot of local businesses that are hurting in a very real way. Uh, so please keep that at, at, at the forefront of your thinking. But anyway... Yeah. Let's talk about the holidays. Yeah. So I've always been a huge advocate of the uh, Shop Small initiative uh, that was run through American Express. Uh, it's a time really where uh, patrons can give back to our local community because, you know, uh, uh, eight cents on every, uh, uh, what is it, 80 cents on every dollar goes back into our local community that's spent in our local community. I think it's actually 86 cents, which is even more. Remarkable. So it's remarkable. So people are spending within their communities when you spend with them. So, uh, you know, there's, there's families out there that have their kids in local sports that have their, that are trying to pay for their, their daughter's gymnastics and trying to just do things to be involved locally as well. So that's kind of the drive with Shop Small is that realize that local business is the forefront of every community. And as small businesses right now, especially the fact that most were closed and still some are still operating less than they can, you know, for months at a time. Um, now is more than ever to really think of them uh, during the holiday season. And I'm actually going to promote myself. I'm going to promote every small business on Staten Island, you know, even if it's another jeweler, just shop small. I yeah. mean, if you if you have your local jeweler that you're dealing with, if you have your local uh, uh, clothes stores that you're dealing with, there are so many opportunities on Staten Island to keep your money on Staten Island. And especially now more than ever, now is the time to be able to uh, support our local communities and uh, support our local businesses. So if you don't know, uh, you know, you do a search for something you're looking for, a special gift or something. With us, uh, we always have fun things that we do. Uh, you know, where we have a, a, sh uh, a Black Friday week. We're doing it a week. Usually it's Black Friday weekend and Small Business Saturday, which is the Friday after Black Friday, the next day, uh, where businesses come together and we rally and we do promotions and fun stuff. You know, we do our stand-up sale. It's called... So back when uh, uh, players were kneeling, let's call it, mm -hmm. uh, we decided to stand up for our military, for our local community, and uh, for small business. And we do our annual stand-up sale. This is our fourth one. Uh, we actually do a half-off, half-the-store event. Wow. Uh, we're doing it now for a week, the week leading up to Small Business Saturday and Black Friday, just because of the amount of people we're allowed to have in the store. It generally is very, very busy over those few days, so we decided to do it at a week-long event. There you go. And uh, at the same time, you know, we have donated close to uh, $10,000 to the Stephen Siller Foundation Beautiful. through it. Uh, that's that's for us standing up for our military and also for our community as well, uh, is to be able to give back to an organization that has done so much to help soldiers and military, yeah. active, retired, um, you know. Wonderful especially, folks. Yeah, especially after tragedy happens in their lives. Uh, you know, building homes for them uh, that are uh, for people who lost limbs and other stuff that that survived. Right. Yeah. But they did it for us and they did it supporting our country. So I feel like that's the number one thing, I guess, too, is, is, you know what? Remember that these people are out there fighting for us when people decide these athletes decide to take a knee. They're taking a knee for those guys who are out there fighting. Now, I understand it's kind of it could get a little hairy as to why they're taking the knee or what they're doing. But, you know, the uh, the NFL did something where they locked arms and locked united the first week, you know, and they stood united uh, the first week. Rather than taking a knee, they locked arms, and there was a Patrick Mahomes actually spoke uh, about standing united as a, as a country. And that's, that's what we should be doing. You know, we shouldn't be segregating ourselves, I feel like. We should be standing united. So this event that we do, we're able to give back to an organization that is helping our military, but at the same time, we're also giving back to our community and thanking our community in a way as well. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. So it, it, the, it's, it's crazy. The whole taking a knee thing, um, 
you know, you, you understand when you, when you get invested in the process that some people felt that they had to do something that right. would put the spotlight on some of the inequities in the system. And, and I understand, and I appreciate that very much so. Um, but uh, the other side feels like, well, does it have to be something that so profoundly uh, hurts other folks? So, again, understand both sides of it. Yep. Just everyone, just try and do a little better. If we all try and do a little better and be a little bit more, you know, cognizant of our neighbor and what's happening, I, I think that we'll, we're all going to be a hell of a lot better off for it. So, as we head here... Uh, into the holidays, is there any uh, indicators that you guys look at as far as what you anticipate is going to be the volume of business? I know I'm kind of jumping all over. No, no, here, you're but, okay. You're okay. Um, uh, I was curious if you know. You know, we're grateful that we've been busy leading up after COVID. We were able to actually open up mid June or mm -hmm. so. Uh, we did remain busy. Actually, I did something a little funny. Actually, I, not funny, but I, I creative. I guess I, um, you know, Google had shut everybody down. Like mm -hmm. once the government, uh, especially the local government. Uh, mandated that we shut down you know they basically took our listings and made us all closed so i actually reached out to google directly really yeah i didn't know that Yeah, because i tried to update my listing it said i was closed and i tried to update it and say that i was open and they wouldn't let me do it you're kidding so me. i had to put up yeah i had to put an exception into place and say that i'm operating from my home and I'm, i'll be uh you know so needless to say i was able to get google to put that we were open 24 7 uh during this pandemic during this time when we were closed so i had my cell phone number on the website uh, for three months and uh we did okay you know what um i drove around i homeschooled my kids my wife was just, god bless my wife jess you know i hope you're listening i love you you're the best she went out there and served our community when i couldn't and i uh, worked at a COVID icu out in uh, patterson new jersey at st wow. joe's for seven weeks and uh she impacted the lives of others while i was home homeschooling the kids yep. and uh and delivering jewelry whenever i can you know during during the off hours when when they were okay so um you know uh she went and did what she was supposed to do and went out there and, and supported the community she was a pediatric intensive care nurse uh at the time and um yeah and just went out and did everything she needed to do in order to serve those who needed her most at that point and it was scary for her um, there I was mean, a it had to be for seven weeks. It was after the seven weeks. It was it was hard coming home and you know sitting down at dinner time, uh, asking her how her day went was never a, a jolly good day, right? right? It was always not a good day, you know. Um, and and it was scary for us as a family, but at the same time, I knew that she was strong enough to go out there and do what she needed to do, and she did it. You know, and she, she impacted the lives of others. So I'm proud that she's my wife. I'm proud of the determination that she had to go do this. But also at the same time, she set the perfect example for our children to not think of yourself first, but to think of others first is exactly what she did. Well, so, God bless her for it. Yeah. Um, we don't talk enough about our significant others and what an unbelievable role they play in our lives. Yes. And, uh, yeah, my wife got a special seat reserved yeah. up there she's gonna get up to those pearly gates and they're gonna be like you dealt with this dude yeah, 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 I, uh, with this you, dude. you go right oh, to the listen, top oh, you have no idea <laughs> yeah you have no idea yeah she's she's good too she's in good hands my wife uh, uh not my hands but, you know but she puts up with us it's a it's a listen if it wasn't for them they raise our children they're, they're for our children they brought them to where they are and they've allowed us to do the things that we need to do in order to support our family so that's what a team does you know we're a team yeah, team. my wife has played a, an unbelievable role in yeah. allowing me to make some of the decisions I've made, good and bad, yeah. you know. Um, and I, it's funny, nobody really knows the story either. I knew I was going to marry my wife the second I saw her. They, you know, and I'm not a mushy, wishy-washy kind of guy, yeah. but the second I saw her, I knew. Why'd you see her? So she was coming out of, we went to dinner. Well, let me give you, a, uh, okay. I know we're running a little long. Do you have a few more minutes? Um, yeah, yeah. All right. So we, we had uh, the, our friends, common friends, tried to introduce us um, like two years before we met. And um, me being just work, 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 right? You know, uh, I was difficult 
in making that connection. And we finally got connected and my wife brings this up all the time. I'm super precise in, it's just in my work, right? So I'm on the phone with her and I had just walked in and my dogs were barking and she says, uh, oh, you have dogs. And now like, I love my dogs, love my dogs, my babies. And I can hear in her voice, she wasn't yeah. like a dog person. Right. So she's like, oh, and I said, yeah. I said, like, right away, it's becoming combative, right? And I was like, you know what? Can I give you a call back in seven minutes? And to me, it was just like, I looked at my watch, and I was like, okay, I've got to take care of a couple of things. going to take me six minutes, give a minute for error. <laughs> call you in seven minutes. Just my insane brain. Yeah. So she was like, yeah, okay, call me in seven minutes. One thing leads to another. We don't exactly hit it off. So two more years go by. We're both still single, and our friends are like, no, you guys are meant for each other. You have to get together. And I'm like, you know what? Whatever. Fine. So I begrudgingly go, blind date. I'd never seen a picture, never anything. Um, and we went to go pick her up at work. She had, uh, she was the catering manager for Finia Hotels. Okay. And she had come downstairs. And I looked to the right. And she just had like this light. And I was kept thinking to myself, Lord, let that be her. And it was. Yeah. And uh, I knew that second. We went out to dinner. And, you know, being in the dating game, you know, this etiquette. And blah, blah, we went to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. And she ate half the menu. Literally. And I was like, That's she's it. authentic. <laughs> she's the one. She's absolutely the one. She was doubling down on dessert. Down. She, I mean, forget about it. Oh, you're going to finish your steak. Yeah. And I'm like... You know, because when you're going through that process, it's so not genuine. Yeah, and yeah. she was straight genuine. up genuine. So um, funny. It does happen yeah. when the love of first sight nonsense. I'm still calling it nonsense, even though I went through it. Yeah. Um, and it, she's been there by my side ever since. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Good stuff. Good stuff is right. So. How do people find you? Let's let's bring this to a, a wrap here. What what's the best way for people to reach out and to get in touch if if they uh, they want to come shop the store and they want to find you on social? What's the best way to, to get a hold of you? So yeah, great question actually. So social media, uh, we're always posting specials, events, and fun stuff that we're doing. We're actually doing a best costume contest right now, Halloween costume contest, which is a lot of fun. Over two hundred entries, uh, all through social media. Find us on Instagram. Find us on Facebook. You can find out what we're doing for the holidays. We're giving people back money. We're doing promotions. We're, if it snows five inches on Christmas Day, you're getting all your money back. For wow. Five, yeah, we're doing some fun stuff for the holidays. So definitely follow us on social. You can go to our website, casaljewelers.net. Always come by our store. We're open Tuesday through Saturday right now. We will be open seven days a week for the holiday. Uh, we're located at 1639 Richmond Road, right down Toad Hill in between Buell and Four Corners. There's always a friendly face there. Whether you need a simple gift, that's $20. Whether you need a jewelry repair, a watch battery, not free. <laughs> not free. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're able to really, uh, anything you need, whether it's an engagement ring, a wedding band, you need anything, we're, we're there for you. Our staff is friendly. Our staff is re ready to help. Not going to force you into a big purchase that you're not ready to go. We, ca we cater to your budget. We custom design gifts. We, we're really like the all-in store. You know, really all in to make sure that you're happy and, and my girls can gift wrap better than others, <laughs> better than anybody. I will put them up against any other jewelry store on Staten Island and they will gift wrap better. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, you'll, you'll find a friendly face. You'll get a beautiful gift that you'll treasure forever. And um, we'll do the right thing, of course, every well, time. I really appreciate you coming in. Yes. I appreciate everything you've done in the community. You are really a, a true leader. And uh, you're leading by example and you're doing great things and you've impacted me. Uh, you've in impacted a lot of folks out there. And for that, I am grateful. Uh, I do appreciate you coming in for episode 20, 20. <laughs> and spending some time with us today. Yes. It's great to see you, bro. It was fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get together keep doing, again. Keep doing the good you're doing too, brother. Don't, don't let that, don't let me overshadow you because you're doing just as good Look, man, as I, all of us. It, so I'm out there I trying and uh, I'm not afraid anymore. Yeah. So I appreciate it. Okay. Great. All right, bro. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, brother. Take care, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. As always, uh, please keep the comments, suggestions, criticism, all of it. Uh, we enjoy it. If you're interested in coming on the show, please reach out and uh, everybody stay safe. Mm -hmm.